Thanks very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to participate. And let me just start out by trying to motivate what may sound like a rather off-the-wall proposal to you. Um, we all agree, I think, that one of the reasons we're here is because of the increase in uh, drug prices for cancer, both the pr prices of newly launched drugs, but also the post-launch price increases, the year-on-year -year increases. And we've talked some already about some of the reasons for that, about rising R&D costs, about shrinking patient bases, et cetera. But I think what we haven't emphasized explicitly, at least not connected to the pricing, is that the way that we manage our insurance coverage has basically removed any constraints on prices. Traditionally, drug prices have been controlled to a certain extent by tiered cost sharing. And that worked fine for things like statins and anti ulcerants where there are very similar drugs that could be played off against each other and manufacturers gave discounts for preferred formulary positioning. But cancer doesn't work like that. The drugs are differentiated. The prices are so high that for most patients with good coverage, as we've heard over and over again, Basically, one series, one course of treatment blows through the upper limit on cost sharing. And so the role of cost sharing is very perverse. It either limits access, which is not good, or it simply is ineffective. And so what manufacturers have realized is that there really is nothing that is constraining prices. And uh, as a result, the proposal that I'm going to put to you would put some sort of constraint on prices, but indirectly and related to value. It is a proposal that is totally compatible with the two you've already heard. It's not an alternative. They're not mutually exclusive. They could be used together. So with that by way of introduction, let me go to the specifics. We've used value in a number of different ways. The ways, way that I am using value is outcome per dollar spent. So value is not just the outcome, but it's value for money. And ironically, we're very comfortable talking about value, even in this sense, I think. But it really is just the inverse of cost effectiveness. Incremental value is additional value relative to some alternative treatment per additional dollar spent, which is the inverse of an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. We're very comfortable talking about additional value. For some reason, we're uncomfortable about talking about ISIS. Uh, so I will continue to talk about value. Uh, why do we care about it? Well, economists care about value because basically, if we were to allocate our resources based on value and build value into both the pricing and the utilization, that would achieve the maximum output for the, the maximum health gain for the budget that we spend and would achieve equity between different users of that budget, different patient groups, different classes of care. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, measuring outcome and cost are, of course, not easy, and I am punting on that and leaving that to experts in this area. But basically, outcome, the concept is that it incorporates patient-centered measures of outcomes, including survival, functional status, toxicities, things like that. And the traditional ways of measuring those outcomes do tend to differ across different types of cancers and across different diseases. For that reason, a commonly used measure that aggregates different dimensions of outcomes is a quality, a quality adjusted life year, which looks at the survival gain but adjusts the additional years of life for the quality of life. And that is what I will be referring to, but it's not certainly not the only measure of outcome that could be used. Um, and then by cost, I mean not just the price of the drug, but all the related costs for that particular episode of care that are related to using that drug. So if using a particular drug uh, entails infusion costs and maybe reduces inpatient days, that would be part of the cost offset that would be taken into account in pricing. 
So now let me give you an overview of the approach, and then I will go through the various parts of this in more detail. So the first step is that outcomes would be assessed probably by an independent agency. Individual payers could do it, but the thought is it would be an independent agency that would evaluate the, evaluate the evidence for the new drug relative to comparators. And then each payer would determine its threshold willingness to pay for, this, for either this particular type of drug, uh, meaning disease class, or for healthcare generally. And this could be expressed as a dollar threshold per quality, uh, a dollar threshold per life year saved, whatever that outcome unit uh, is, the th threshold value would be expressed in terms of that. And it could differ across payers because payers serve patients with very different income levels, uh, different preferences. And for an individual payer, it could also differ by indication. All of those are details to be determined. So the payer would define the maximum willingness to pay per unit outcome. The manufacturer could freely set its price, but subject to that meeting that value constraint. So the existence of a value constraint would constrain the price given the outcomes and the cost offsets that the drug could yield. And then the patient would pay for patients who meet the value th threshold, and co-payments would be kept at a modest level so that cost sharing would not be a barrier to access for patients for whom the drug is uh, of proven value. So that's the general approach. Now, I hope I won't scare you with this, but now let me go through the specifics. I am an economist after all. Uh, so the idea is that the, each payer sets a value threshold for reimbursement that's defined in terms of the, the cost per unit of outcome. And cost is the um, difference in price plus the difference in other treatment costs relative to the different in outcomes, and the, this overall cost effectiveness uh, should be less than the threshold willingness to pay, which, for example, could be $100,000 per quality or $150,000, whatever it may be. So we're looking at the increment in cost relative to existing treatment or whatever the comparator is, uh, relative to the difference in outcomes. So this is a criteria for being re reimbursed. The manufacturer has to meet that value threshold. Given that when the drug uh, is priced, the evidence on the outcomes is known, the evidence on the cost savings are known, the comparator is known, the only unconstrained variable in that equation is the price. So having this value constraint constrains the manufacturer to charge the maximum price it can and still meet the value constraint. So the manufacturer is incentivized to set a price that is what I would call a value-based price. And it's simply equal to the price of the comparator plus the uh, the value of the health gain plus the cost savings relative to the comparator. And so what I really want to point out is although this is a constraint on price, and we repeatedly hear any constraint on price will kill innovation, I want to point out that innovation is rewarded, that a drug that delivers additional health benefits or additional cost savings would get a higher price. Uh, and in, a critical component of this approach is that there is this willingness to pay for value. Because without that, if there is some incremental value, how do we know how much it's worth? In order to get some limit on what the additional price is when there's incremental value, there has to be this threshold willingness to pay, which could be as I've said, variable across payers, across indications, but some limit on what we're willing to pay for health gain. So just summarizing yet again, 
The manufacturer having a, a, a value threshold forces the manufacturer to set a price that meets that value threshold. If there's no incremental value, the price of the new drug is just the price of the existing drugs. There's no premium. If there is significant incremental value in either outcomes or cost offsets, the manufacturer captures that value created in a higher price. And this enables consistent value for money spent across different drugs and uh, across different patients and rewards innovation. So modifications, you know, details of implementation, as I said, different health plans could have their own value thresholds. They could do their own assessments if they wanted to. Uh, those plans that had lower thresholds obviously would approve less drugs or, or have lower prices and more restrictive patient outcome, uh, access, but lower premiums. Um, thresholds could differ between cancer and other drugs, orphan diseases, et cetera. At least in theory, the amount that is reimbursed could differ across indications for the same drug. Uh, this is one of the conundrums that's coming up in drug pricing, and that is when a given cancer drug is used in different indications, the outcomes can be of very different value. And so in principle, that uh, reimbursement could be different for different indications. That obviously raises a practical difficulties of uh, enforcement, but it is in theory a possibility. And then the idea that the price could be adjusted post-launch based on additional uh, data that might be collected uh, is certainly possible and uh, would probably be necessary in some cases. Cost and risk sharing agreements. This is something that we hear quite a bit about. They don't exist that much in the US. They exist a lot in a number of European countries because they tend to arise when payers use this sort of threshold value and when the price that the manufacturer wants to charge does not meet the payer's threshold value. Very often, manufacturers would rather cut their, uh, or give some sort of cost or risk sharing deal rather than cut their price. Because in Europe, if you cut your price in one country, say Germany or the UK, it influences the price in other countries. So you see a number of these deals, they take the form of the manufacturer pays uh, for the first uh, number of doses and then for the uh, for the patient, um, I'm sorry, yes, the manufacturer pays for the first few doses, and then the payer pays for the patients who respond positively, or there's a cap on what the payer would have to pay. So if the patient needs more than a certain number of doses, the manufacturer picks up that cost. So those are simple cost-sharing arrangements. The risk-sharing arrangements are based on outcomes, and they're much more costly to monitor. Some of them this is very rare. The famous example is uh, for MS drugs in the UK, where there was disagreement about what the efficacy would be. And the agreement was that essentially it was a, a reimbursement with e evidence developed after use, and then the price would be adjusted afterwards. It's been very uh, complex to implement. Uh, there have been a few in the UK where the payer only pays if the patient responds. Uh, Velcade uh, was under that sort of agreement. But these outcomes-based arrangements are quite costly to implement. So how does this relate to the ASCO value framework? I, as an outsider, know very little, only what is in the publicly reported media about the uh, ASCO value framework. But I do think there's a lot of commonality the, certainly, both approaches are trying to measure a value looking at both benefits and risks to patients and costs. Uh, the approach I'm proposing would use standard cost effectiveness and cost utility methods. The approach proposed by ASCO, I, I don't know what the methods for measuring and weighing costs and outcomes would be. Uh, the proposal uh, that I'm putting forward would use an independent expert body to implement the assessment of the evidence. ASCO presumably is doing it. Uh, I think probably a fairly comprehensive measure of costs would be used in both cases. The main difference is that the proposal put forward here really is one that is designed to constrain prices indirectly, whereas I think the ASCO proposal is designed uh, 
possibly to constrain prices indirectly, but it's more about uh, in, in encouraging and providing information for value-based utilization. Now, value-based utilization is certainly uh, part of the proposal I'm making here, but that would come about through the payer reimbursing for drugs that meet the value threshold. So it's more payer-oriented, not so much oriented towards uh, the physicians. Lessons from other countries that have tried to implement this sort of thing. Um, the first point I would make is that other countries have definitely reached a conclusion that if patients have comprehensive insurance coverage, then some constraint on price and or reimbursement is necess necessary to constrain prices and expenditures. Because patients are going to be price insensitive, and in that environment, manufacturers have incentives to, to charge very high prices. We cannot blame them. They respond to the system we create. And so if we create a system that has no constraint on prices, there will be no constraint on prices. Um, most of the developed countries have or are moving towards systems that require evidence of effectiveness, usually comparative effectiveness, as part of the negotiation of price and reimbursement at launch. I've listed a number here, but there are many others, so France, Germany, the UK, Sweden, uh, Canada, Japan, the Netherlands, etc. The details of implementation differ, whether it's what the role of the government versus independent bodies are in outcomes assessment, the types of metrics used, the comparators, and whether or not an explicit value threshold is used. I mean, we're all most familiar with NICE in the UK, which is the one that uses an explicit value threshold, uh, but the others do use uh, vari more variable value thresholds. Uh, so those are the general points. Specific to the two countries that certainly have got the most attention, and I think appropriately, are the, first the UK and second Germany. Uh, the UK, in, through NICE, has, through its uh, cost-effectiveness review, indirectly been uh, encouraging value-based pricing and is now moving to do it more explicitly. Uh, one of the things that they have taken the lead on is having a very consistent methodology so that all the drugs that are reviewed are evaluated using a consistent methodology, and therefore there is uh, consistency in the outcomes, and manufacturers have a reasonably good idea of what to expect. The uh, threshold value uh, was £20,000 per quality for a number of years. They've now added some flexibility in that with upper, uh, higher amounts allowed for terminal conditions. And interestingly, this value came out of studies of what the opportunity cost is of resources in the NHS budget because they very much realize that if they spend more money on, on drugs, that means less money for other things. And so they looked at the opportunity cost of other resource use in the H NHS. And they do use patient access schemes quite a lot, mainly because, as I mentioned, if prices are uh, lower in the UK, that influences prices in other parts of the EU. Germany's AMNOG system is much more recent, uh, introduced in about 2010. The company can set the price freely for a year. During that first year, Equig, which is their NICE equivalent, evaluates comparative effectiveness. Uh, the comparator and the outcome measures are determined by the GBA, which is the uh, federal coordinating council, so it's an agent of the federal government. And then if the, no, the new drug is deemed to have no additional benefit, it is put in a reference pricing group with other drugs for the same indication and a similar mechanism of action. And so it's not that it's not reimbursed, it's simply that it's reimbursed at the price of the existing drugs because it is deemed to have no additional benefit. 
If there is additional benefit, then GBA negotiates the price premium using a, an efficiency frontier, they call it, that is disease-specific. But think of it as a value threshold that is disease-specific. So they don't use qualies. They have different outcome metrics for cancer versus uh, osteoporosis or whatever it may be. So there's consistency within disease class, but not between disease classes. Uh, Germany has a system has had a lot of really bad press because a number of drugs, uh, specifically 29% of the drugs that were uh, assessed between the introduction around 2010 and 2014 were found to have only 29% were found to have some additional benefit, i.e. 71% were found to have no additional benefit which is rather shocking, and therefore got the prices of the existing drugs. That is rather shocking, but it is partly because there's been a real issue with having adequate data. The GBA, as I mentioned, names the uh, comparator and is, has not been satisfied with just the clinical trial data, but on the other hand, doesn't allow modeling the way that NICE does. And so a lot of the frustration has been the requirement for data not allowing modeling, and that, I think, with careful implementation, could certainly be avoided. So conclusions, um, the US really does lack other countries. The great majority of other countries are moving in the direction of requiring evidence of value to support price and reimbursement. The, out, the proposal outlined here is not direct price controls. It is simply requiring that value be demonstrated for reimbursement, which indirectly constrains price, but in relation to the value created so that it preserves incentives for innovation. Uh, it would not cut prices in the US because we would be benchmarking the new drug prices to the existing drug prices, but it would constrain the growth of prices going forward. It would not reduce our access to drugs to the level of access in the UK or Germany because there's a very strong presumption we would use a higher willingness to pay. We would start off with higher uh, drug prices. And so we would end up with somewhat higher pr drug prices, but the rate of growth would be constrained. So I leave you with the, um, I think, hopeful comment that we're already well into trying to measure the outcomes. It would be relatively simple to move to measuring value in terms of outcome per dollar spent. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Maybe that got the attention of some of our friends in pharma who are here today. So our last talk is uh, from Kevin Olson, who's at Providence Cancer Center in uh, Portland. And he's going to be talking about lessons from Evidence-Based Review Commission for the Oregon Health Authority. Kevin? Thank you.